This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 406 of the Yellow World Pod. I'm your host Stefan Wozko and today we will talk about Borussia Dortmund's come from behind win against Eintracht Frankfurt and we will preview Friday's match against SC Freiburg for all that and more. Joins me Matthias Zuck, once again Matthias, with me on the panel. Hello Matthias, how are you doing? Hello Stefan, I am doing well. How are you today? I'm doing also really excellent. Thanks for asking. It's... Uh, it's one of those days where you had like a good night of sleep and, uh, you know, you got all, no, not all, of, but a lot of work done in the morning and, you know, everything's going well so far. So, I don't know. I feel like nothing can derail my day today. Uh, <laughs> Dude, don't say that. <laughs> How are you? Never you? say it. Never <laughs> say it. You can think it. The problem is I'm in the same boat as you. <laughs> really good night's sleep and... All the kids behaved, all the dogs <laughs> behaved, a lot of productivity before lunch. Ah, uh, yeah. So, okay, <laughs> let's talk about Dortmund. <laughs> well, you see, with your uh, uh, time zone difference, uh, you were, I think, one or two hours behind me. Uh, two hours. So so you, your jinx has even more power than mine, to be honest. But, uh, you know, let's talk about the things that uh, actually matter, and that is uh, Boris Dortmund got another W to start uh, this year, which is very nice, Matthias. And uh, <laughs> it was funny that the last win in Frankfurt was, what, 2013, when Mkhitaryan scored a brace. So, um, yeah, in their eighth attempt, Dortmund finally replicates a win, uh, but it wasn't quite the sort of victory you would. I don't know. I don't. I don't want. I don't know if I want to say expect or not. But it it was a very difficult game for Dortmund. That was for sure. And uh, I mean, they pulled it out of the bag later. But it, it it was such an odd game, Matthias. I don't know. Just just give me your thoughts first, and then I'll ramble for ten minutes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Marco Rosa in the press conference after the match probably said it best when a reporter asked him, oh, this is the perfect result for you, isn't it? It showed the mentality and that their ability to overcome difficult situations and win the game. And Marco Rosa is like, well, I don't know. I mean, had we kept a clean sheet and won 3-0, that would have been a pretty good one, too. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, it was different school of thoughts <laughs> that were clashing. The yes, journalist was yes. like... Now you have all the mistakes on display and you can tell your players what to do better. <laughs> and you still get the win and Marco Rosa basically was, yeah, but maybe I would just like to show them what they got right <laughs> and get the win. Exactly. exactly. It's a double-edged sword. I mean, I get what the reporter was asking and, and to a certain degree I also agree with him because, you know, this match, it started off great. I mean, the first 15 minutes, <laughs> Dortmund were on fire uh, Thomas Meunier almost scoring like a, a worldy goal uh, after, I don't even know when that was, but it was pretty early. And then, and then Philip Kostic was given a free kick in a slightly, you know, half left position. I'm like, oh crap. Yeah, let's talk about you know? this. Let's talk um, about this, how, how, how this free kick came yeah. about, because yeah. I was very annoyed with have Emily John. Yeah, yeah, I was. You very know, annoyed I know. Because I know. First of all, obviously, it's it's not usual that Hinteregger is this far forward, um. But you know, so the the, the first complaint, obviously, is how Dortmund give the ball away because Emre Can just re regains possession on the on the right side, still very deep, and you have. Basically, Meunier and Marlin standing in the same spot and not really trying to move around. And uh, the only option that John has to sort of play the ball. Well, not the only option, but he did play it to Brandt. And, uh, you know, by itself, that pass isn't so bad. And Brandt then tries to play it to Marlin, who is already making a run. 
Uh, unlike Thomas Muni, for example, who has taken himself out of the game because he couldn't make one or two steps to the side or front or wherever just to to get open. Now, the, the, the big problem here with this giveaway is that Julian Brandt in the entire scene does not look where his opponent is. You know, he's a, he's a central midfielder and he does not look over his shoulder. And that, to me, is a very crucial mistake, you know, and... Eintracht Frankfurt to me are an opponent that has Champions League caliber for for this season. I I you know if if they continue like they did toward the end of the Hinrunde, I see them in the Champions League ranks, and I think it was a, a very formidable opponent. And I feel like these are small little details a player of Julian Brandt's caliber should get right. That you first of all make sure where your opponent is, so, so then when you then try to play it pass first time, uh, it's not intercepted and blocked off right away. But then, of course, Elrajan with the foul where there was absolutely no need for it because Hinteregger would have not gone really anywhere. Dortmund were still in a good organizational block. And uh, it was also just a weird tug. You know, the Frankfurt did not have any real passing lanes open for Hinteregger to go anywhere. And to me, that's just... Really annoying, and uh, I think I tweeted in my frustration that I'm very glad when Emre Can is on a different team. And, uh, you know, I, I know you like Emre Can, and uh, I don't. <laughs> we disagree a little bit on that. But, uh, Jesus, the, these things are just very infuriating. And, uh, yeah, then uh, if, if you fast forward, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds, then you once again see why Dortmund's set piece defending is just shoddy. I mean, it was a great delivery, and Bore had a good finish, but... Yeah, uh, I don't know who was napping. I think Bellingham was uh, not uh, in in the position he needed to. Um, yeah, he wasn't tracking right. But um, but it was also a very kicked set. Yeah, piece. yeah. I mean, it's not every set, not every goal that uh, gets conceded is because of uh, mistakes in a, in a set piece. I mean, it's not like you know um, Marius Wolf Köln flick on uh, <laughs> corner. Which that was just boggled the second time uh, going back there. This was perfectly struck. It was struck into that that no man's land zone where keepers are caught between those two minds of do I come out, do I not come out? But then hit with that pace and precision. Kuba maybe maybe could have been a little stronger in his reaction. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Do you, do you think um, he needs to save it? I think. I mean, he got a lot on it. When a keeper gets uh, is in that type of position, you would you would hope that they would do better, but it's you it know. But then you saw from a very close range. It, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like uh, Schwolo, um performance against Köln for for Hertha, where that thing just kind of went through him. <laughs> but this um, getting back to the actual situation of the foul, and and what you mentioned with Julian Brandt is exactly one of the main main issues and why I don't like seeing him in central midfield. His type of move, what he did there, is what you do in the final attacking third as a winger to try to play that quick little no-look flick-on pass to unlock the defense in a certain position. You cannot do that in the middle of the pitch. You just cannot do that. I will argue that um, Emre Can, if Emre Can were in Julian Brandt's position and that ball would have come from Akanji, that situation probably wouldn't happen because he's a more experienced central midfielder and he does look around where people are. Um, yeah, but going I'm sorry, to the foul, you know, you can't just say, yeah. okay, Julian Brandt's playing in, in, in central midfield and he has to do that. I don't care, even if he's an attacking or a striker, I don't care what position you play. If you in that zone of the field, you look over your shoulder. It's not that hard. No, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I'm just saying that his natural tendency is more... Is, is different there. He, yeah, his he doesn't, natural tendency is not to orient himself yes, where his opponents are. Correct. And hence, he plays too often. Yep. passes. Too often. Yep. Yeah. He did that with Hertha. Yeah. He did that and against Hertha. Us. Exactly. Imagine where um, we'd be if we had beaten Hertha. You know, we'd be three points off Bayern right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I still think somehow that, that match was destined to be lost just because of the back line that kind of had to get thrown together. But be that as it may, when it comes to Emre John's Foul, then, I agree with you. I mean, all too often, fouls that are committed in that position of the field, you know, that kind of off to the wing, are almost always, 
though not exclusively, <laughs> but almost always unnecessary fouls. Because most of the time, unless you're facing Ian Robin, the player is going away from you, away from the goal, or straight to the byline. Rarely are they trying to drive at you towards the goal. Rarely. And when it's a player like Hintaega, he has no attacking instinct. So he's not going to drive that way. So it was an unnecessary foul. It was a little clumsy. Uh, you know, he stepped on his toes. You know, it's not like he came in and just cleared him out, which honestly I would have preferred. But there was also a pull. Situation. You know, he, he talked to Yeah, him. there was a pull. It was, it, yeah. I mean, Hintaega is a, is a player that, yeah, I, I, I loved his little exchanges with Holland. <laughs> but, which I, I think we'll talk about that later yeah. as well. Because uh, I have my opinions there. But it was an unnecessary foul after an unnecessary loss of possession uh, against, I mean, the only other player I would have been like, oh, Christ, not him, it would be Daniel Kelly Jury <laughs> from a similar position. Um, because there are just certain players, God, that's like their sweet spot of whipping in a free kick. And that is a cost, that's, that's his spot. And he did an, an excellent job. Um, you know, Bore, who I know a lot of people were kind of down on because it took him a long time to get going. I actually really like him. Um, and I watch a decent amount of Argentinian football where he, where he came from. And I'm glad to see him clicking for Frankfurt because I feel like it's just a perfect fit for who he is, the type of player he is, and the way Frankfurt like to play. So... Um, it was kind of, Hey, I'm glad the guy got a brace and Dortmund got the win. So it kind of worked out in a way. Um, but no, it was, it was unnecessary. And then Dortmund after that goal, just for 30 minutes, I mean, until halftime, just completely, I, I don't want to say they completely lost confidence, but they lost focus for sure. Um, they lost their energy. I think more than anything else, because you can't say they lost confidence given how the second half turned out, but they, it just, their flow was gone. Their rhythm was gone. Their attacking intent was gone. And Frankfurt took over the match for 30 minutes and deservedly went up 2-0. Uh, Dortmund were lucky that uh, uh, Frankfurt didn't score a third goal because I think then it would have been done. But granted, then Dortmund also hit the woodwork just before halftime. So those two, I will count as canceling each other out in that situation. Um, so yeah, you can't argue with a, a two nil lead for Frankfurt at the half. No, no. I mean, you can, I feel, I think the two one actually would have been sort of fair because that one weren't all that terrible. True. No, no. But, I mean, but they, they had right. their opportunities. See, it's, it's super annoying that you have such a strong start, right? And, you you see a lot of things that Dortmund do in in those say fifteen minutes or so before Bore scores uh, that you want to see from Dortmund against an opponent like Frankfurt where you see aggressive play you see uh, them win the the ball upfield and uh, you know a couple of transition attacks and there were some good combinations also with Marlon who was more out on the right wing also between Hin and Brandt and then of course yet this uh, thing was. Already in the second minute, this beautiful um, pass by by Hummels to Minier. Um, so there are a lot of tools that Dortmund utilized in the early 15 minutes where you are happy with what you're seeing. And then all of a sudden, you know, Frankfurt sort of pulled the plug on Dortmund. And it just, once again, as I've described before, it just feels so self-inflicted. Because this is not a goal you you must concede and I think this is a thing I I don't know if I I talked about it enough because on the last episode you know when I was talking about sort of new new year's resolutions for Dortmund or or just the general strategy is like concede fewer goal, goals and uh uh yeah basically become a more sturdy defense but Obviously, a main part of it is also just ball handling and security with the ball and the, the position and uh, positional play is also very important in that regard that, uh, you know, you give Julian Brandt options of open players so that he doesn't have to use the one option that's then easily intercepted. These are just uh, the small little details that uh, Dortmund have to work on and uh, I feel like 
focus is such a big word right now because if you look really closely before Brandt gives away the ball before the foul, you just don't see Dortmund players really moving and and opening themselves up. You know, it just feels only only Frankfurt are reacting to what is happening and Dortmund are just freezing for a moment. You know, they're sort of switching off because, ah, oh, we just regained possession. I don't have to run anymore. And then, you know, want to take like two or three seconds, uh, you know, for to to get into a more attacking shape or whatnot. And I don't want know that they don't have that time. And uh, it's frustrating because obviously you can fix a defense by, by adding better personnel and you can, uh, you know, I- I improve your defensive organization as a whole, but also... Just don't lose the ball as cheaply. I feel like Dortmund make these mistakes far too often. And, um, you know, a player like Julian Brandt just needs to do much, much better. But, uh, you know, there are obviously other culprits all the time as well. It's not just Julian Brandt, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, it's 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 really annoying because I feel like there are some collective mistakes that just uh, undo the good work of Dortmund overall as a collective uh, uh, in the previous 15 minutes. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel like the frustration then to to deal with having played and started well but then sort of uh, being one nil behind in frankfurt i think literally scored with their first shot they had um is something that Rosa also mentioned after the game that uh, they need to find a way to deal with this better and uh, yeah obviously i agree because uh, it was clearly evident that frankfurt then sort of took over even though dortmund i th- i think still had like 61% possession in the first half but it just wasn't uh, th- the same game. It wasn't the same structure. And uh, the aggression that Dortmund showed previously just wasn't there then. And, uh, you know, the 2-0 the was also a little bit lucky because of <laughs> Marco Reus' second touch, really just handing the ball to Bure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, and, and you can't even unlucky. fault him because he was hustling all the way back to try to help defend and he just touched it wrong. I mean, it happens. It's an unfortunate situation. It just f- fell perfectly for a hot goal scorer. Yeah, but again, uh, you know, a thing I, I've been talking for years about now is that Dortmund too often fail to play themselves out of a right-back or left-back isolation. <laughs> you know, once again, Meunier tried to pass it to Brandt, who was clearly in coverage, and he tried to play a forceful pass, so I don't even know, had the ball arrived at Brandt, uh, how this first touch would have looked like. Uh, but either way, it got intercepted, uh, and that's obviously a tactical fault because uh, the way Dortmund stood and the way Frankfurt pressed Dortmund in this situation, um, I, I think Dortmund need to also f- have more players uh, to you know on as an option for for Meunier. Be it Marlin coming back more to the right wing and and uh, you know closing the distance to Meunier or or Brandt, you know building a couple more triangles. Because then obviously Frankfurt can quickly switch the play. I think it took like two or three seconds until uh, Kostic had the ball on the on the left wing and was pretty much unmarked. And he pinged the ball into the box. And uh, yeah, Dortmund nearly uh, conceded at first. And Reus hustles back and uh, still it's a goal. So um, yeah, these are just situations in, in, in my book where... Um, Dortmund, from a tactical standpoint, have to do better and you, you know in possession in order to defend better. And uh, these are stupid mistakes because Meunier needs to see the situation a little bit better. You know, I think his best option, uh, which also is a difficult option, but would have been a switch of play to Guerrero. But you know, I can't expect that from Meunier necessarily. But still, um, if if your nearest midfielder is clearly covered, you might have have to punt the ball forward <laughs> you know as dumb as it sounds but uh you, you know if you if you turn around and play to Hummels that wasn't a good option either maybe back to Kobel but in from that position also very difficult so you know if if you don't really have any other option and Frankfurt force you to play the ball long then just play it long and uh, have them you know build from the back instead of uh, having a transitional play you know, it's it's always easy for me to sit here like the Monday morning quarterback and uh, analyze these things. But uh, to, to to me, these are 
you know, very basic details in, in football that need to be gotten right and Dortmund are getting them wrong right now. And it's it's very frustrating because it's not uh, like they need, uh, I don't know, <laughs> Pep Guardiola to come in. I feel like uh, any football coach can can fix that and sort it out. But uh, yeah, it's it's frustrating to see these basic mistakes along a, a lot of good play that Dortmund provide. You know, obviously every football team always will make mistakes because that's how the game is. But, you know, the mistakes that Dortmund are making right now are on such a basic level that uh, I get very flustered. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. But, uh, yeah, maybe maybe talk about um, the second half. Uh, first of all, I think the the takeaway that Emre Can maybe is not a good centre-back option uh, solidified once again after Lindström really... Uh, not necked him, <laughs> and you could see the soul <laughs> leaving Emre Can's body right there. But uh, yeah, good save by Kobel slash uh, unlucky that Lindström couldn't quite hit the ball, uh, you know, with with a bit of more angle. But uh, yeah, uh, that was that was utterly hilarious how Lindström all of a sudden had like 10, 20 meters of space, and uh, Emre Can just tried to I don't know attack him while he was speed dribbling. Not a good idea. I don't know bit more shadow defense here <laughs> maybe but uh matthias that's maybe one one point before we talk about the good stuff um that sort of was me scratching my head when i saw emre Can as a center back instead of pongracic um because i still feel like having a, a true center back in the center back position is better than than putting a midfielder there yeah yeah um ideally sure uh, but obviously, there is an issue with Pongracic that we are not privy to uh, that, um, I guess, reflects training or attitude. Uh, I mean, we can't forget the the issues he's had off the field this season. I think about interviews or I think it was at a Twitch stream or some bullshit like that uh, where he shot his mouth off about the team that's actually paying him. Uh, and his employer, which is Wolfsburg. So I think there's there's just a, a trust issue there. I mean, if, if he doesn't play him, then it's clearly a trust issue. Um, he played against Hatta. You know, uh, I think the less said about that match <laughs> in general, the better. And it, it wouldn't put it all on Pongracic. It was just a collective failure. Yeah, not um, next to Witzel and whoever the... No, what, was it Schultz and... Was Meunier there? Sure, I think so. Meunier was on the other side, but then hits behind it. It was just, it was just yeah. a, a, it was a difficult game. Let's call it that. You know, and Ponga just started the season okay, and then he's, he, you know, he kind of fell flat after that. Um, thinking specifically of the Bielefeld game where he was a complete liability, and so uh, obviously there is a total lack of trust. Uh, not having Witzel in there, I think, was a an obvious choice. Uh, having John play in there better than Witze, would he be better than Pongracic? I honestly I don't know. Um, it's it's down to the coaches coaching team's decision based on what they see all week and four weeks, which we don't. And so be it. I mean, I I know people. Apparently, Marco Rose is the worst coach in history now uh, <laughs> because he he didn't play Pongracic and because you know a thirty million euro striker who's not an out and out striker uh, was put on the wing, even though that is exactly the right decision to make. And we talked about that last week um, that you can't have that isolation with uh, uh, Goming at Munier on that side with Kostic. However. I will say Malin's defensive positioning when he uh, stood out wide was fine, but not good because <laughs> Frankfurt could just chip the ball over him or quickly transition around him. And then you had Kostic on Meunier one-on-one because Kostic had that more advanced position, which obviously was to his detriment defensively because... Dortmund then chipped the ball right over him and there was a ton of space. But, you know, Malen playing higher up because Dortmund had less pressures than Frankfurt, but uh, like a big chunk of them, um, I think it was like a third of them were in the attacking third. So Malen was higher up, which meant 
you basically were playing without a winger. Uh, it's only when Dortmund dropped deeper and Malin moved further out wide, then they didn't play it to Kostic, but then they found other avenues. So the the tactical decision to put Malin out wide, I think, was the correct one. His interpretation of that role defensively <laughs> was not great because it really didn't help anything. You may as well not have had him there. Um, but as far as Pongacic versus Chan, I can just say... It's something that we don't see because we're not in all the training sessions. We're not in all the one-on-one conversations, you know, tactical uh, meetings and so on. So it's clearly something there. Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to say because in hindsight, obviously, you can say maybe you played Pongracic, but had Pongracic played and screwed up a lot, then uh, you would have been like, maybe play John. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's a little sad because uh, obviously... Uh, Dortmund do have a buy option uh, for uh, Pongracic and would have been 12 million and had Pongracic um, worked out really well and everyone would be super happy with him and uh, uh, <laughs> this would have been a nice pickup to be honest <laughs> but uh, you know right now it's really not looking that way and um, yeah I don't know he also liked to post uh, today and then had to apologize uh, on uh, on Instagram or whatever, because I think the post said that, uh, you know, Lothar Matthäus and Kicker said if Dortmund would work like Frankfurt uh, and or like Freiburg or Mainz, they'd be able to beat Bayern. Um, yeah, M- maybe Matthäus has a point there, but nevertheless, uh, not a good look if you like it as a Dortmund player, but uh, I think he had a statement on Instagram that he uh, accidentally liked it and didn't even notice he did it. I'm sure. Whatever. I I honestly also don't care, um, to be honest. But, uh, you know, it's just another little story um, of uh, unnecessarily. But I I guess liking stuff on Instagram is easy or so. Um, Anyway, uh, Matthias, now on to the bit more positive stuff. Um, We were talking about Kostic. Um, I don't think he actually contributed way, you know, a lot to this game. And... uh, I think he he had one shot that uh, wasn't really much of a threat um in like the uh, what was it 78th minute I see um but uh, you know obviously his 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 pass or his cross um led to the 2-0 but other than that I'll be honest with you I think Dortmund did a really good job of uh, nullifying Kostic considering his skill and uh, you know considering that Dortmund played with Malin and Meunier on that right side. So all that being said, I think they did a pretty good job to contain him. And I think that needs to be applauded and lauded because he clearly is uh, Frankfurt's standout player and uh, making him, uh, you know, this tame over 90 minutes is very positive to me. And uh, I'm very glad with that because it also means that Frankfurt did not have too many transition moments um, so um, th- there needs to be p- some praise here because I think that Dortmund overall handled the, handled the ball much, much better in the second half than in the first half and uh, the focus was way higher and the pressure was uh, much bigger on Frankfurt than it was before and, um, you know, the other standout player in this game uh, offensively was obviously Lindström and he had a couple moments, um, but... Uh, you know, I'm still very glad uh, the way that Dortmund overall defended and, and kept the ball because um, Frankfurt are a team that can exude a lot of attacking pressure and I think that Dortmund uh, were doing very well in that. So there are a couple of points, obviously, I'm I'm going to go uh, over now that uh, maybe make more sense from a Frankfurt perspective, but I feel like Dortmund did not only win this game uh, at the same time, I also feel like Frankfurt lost this game in a very untypical Frankfurt fashion because it is unusual for Frankfurt to be this passive uh, over an entire second half. Uh, there's just no way around it. I feel like that uh, not having any fans in the stands minus the 250 VIPs or whatever it was um, really helped Dortmund this time because I don't think a full Eintracht Frankfurt stadium uh, would allow this team to be this passive for this long. And... Uh, it was something that we've seen Dortmund do a lot under Lucien Favre when they had like a one elite and then just sat back and hoped they could bring it over the time. And uh, I think 
you know, I've listened to a lot of Frankfurt fans now complain, and I think uh, Glasner did the same after the game, said uh, there was not a lot of impetus on Frankfurt's side to really have quick attacks, and they rather, you know, circulated possession and uh, pass the ball back to Trapp, etc. So, um, as, as great as Dortmund's comeback is, I think there's a little caveat there that uh, Frankfurt's also contributed in a in a big way to not really make things more tough on Dortmund. And I think, uh, you know, taking off Rode and Lindström was a big break for Dortmund too because A, it took away um, the little attacking threat that Frankfurt had because I think Sam Lammers was uh, pretty useless and uh, uh, he, he got apparently a very negative reaction for that on, on Instagram. Um, but I also thought that uh, Sebastian Rode had a really uh, terrific game and uh, his aggression in midfield really... Uh, you know, helped Frankfurt a lot and uh, Jakic, who I think actually, if he were fit, would have started ahead of Rode, um, couldn't quite replicate that. And, uh, you know, that being said, um, I, I, I think that Frankfurt have to work on these things. It's very rare for them that they have a 2 0 lead in such a situation against a team like Dortmund. So um, it's maybe natural for them to not quite know what to do and uh, they got a little bit scared. Um, but nevertheless, um, that is one of the big factors why Dortmund managed to pull this game out of the hat. But uh, I think we can also talk about uh, the substitution of uh, Torgen Hazard for Julian Brandt Matthias because to me that also changed the structure for Dortmund in a way that really benefited the black and yellows. It's almost like he's a better player. Um, <laughs> the Yeah, I mean, the second half... I mean, first going back to your comment about uh, Kostic, he had... Uh, the most touches for Frankfurt and he had the by far the most carries but he also had a pretty bad pass percentage he also attempted the most passes um and all of that you know more so than the goalkeeper or the or the the back line which tends to have the most touches in, in situations like this so no overall they did a very good job in in trying to contain well you can't really contain him right isn't that what the saying is uh, you can, or you can't stop him. You can only hope to contain him. And I feel like they overall probably did uh, yeah. set piece, notwithstanding uh, that was just, you know, that's, that's not really something you can contain the set piece taker in that situation. Um, <laughs> not, not, but legally. With, not legally. No. Um, with five foot in the second half, I agree with you. A full stadium wouldn't have allowed that type of uh, passive display. And, for me, the issue with Do uh, with uh, Frankfurt wasn't so much that they started dropping deeper. Um, I think that's that's a natural situation to do. But the issue then is that they put exuded no pressure on Dortmund um, in any form. They just let Dortmund have time on the ball, think about it, and pass. Even when Dortmund came into the final third, there was very little pressure from Frankfurt. Whereas if you think back, and I think specifically to last season, the Augsburg match, where Augsburg, you know, scored and then sat deep. But once Dortmund got into that final third, they pressed them. They were right on top of them. Think of it more like a Simeone Atletico Madrid. You know, they'll drop deep, but once you get close to the to the final third, they're on you and they're pressing aggressively. Uh, so they, they you don't let you just walk into the box. And that's essentially what Frankfurt did. And the more and more pressure coming from Dortmund, I know all of us, because I could see it on Twitter, were like, you know, this is a game, no matter how many great chances Dortmund are going to have now, how often they're going to shoot on the goal, they're not going to score. And <laughs> then it's like the floodgates just opened. And it was goal, goal. And when the second goal went, I was like, Dortmund's going to win this one. There's just, Frankfurt are... On the rails, it's kind of like if you watch boxing, um, you know, uh, in a heavyweight fight or, or anywhere, the you know, they, they just keep getting hit, keep getting hit, keep getting hit. And then it just kind of cascades and you're like, oh, they're going to get knocked out. And you could just see them on the ropes. And that's what Frankfurt was. Um, I think, um, you know, you know, deer caught in the headlights or something like the, the rabbit in front of the snake. Um, was was said, I think by Glasna, in fact, that they just, in that moment, they were completely shell-shocked. And I I wasn't confident that Dortmund could turn it and, until the second goal when I'm like, okay, now they're going to win it. 
Because before then, it seemed like no matter how often Dortmund tried, they just couldn't score. Because Kevin Trapp had a really good game. I mean, a really good game. Um, A few absolutely world-class saves. And so, you know, a situation a little bit different. Dortmund would have scored earlier. But I think uh, the, the... Passive nature of Frankfurt really helped, but I'm okay with it because how often, Stefan, have we seen that basically flipped the other way around? Exactly. That Dortmund were passive and got punished for it in the past. I don't feel like that's happened since March, specifically that Dortmund have gone passive after getting a lead or being comfortable in a situation and then just getting punished over and over again. So I'm okay with it. And Glasner even alluded to it in the press conference where he said, you know, there are a few times where we scored late to win or get a point or anything like that. And this time we were on the receiving end. That's essentially the sport sometimes. And he's absolutely correct. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And the funny thing is, it worked out well for Frankfurt for like 60-ish minutes or so. You know, once Erling Haaland had this one driving shot, this half volley off target in a 67 minute, uh, 60, yeah, 60, 60 second minute, I, I feel like that's exactly when the when the floodgate started open, to open. You know, Julian Brandt had this one shot, which was a layoff by Royce, and I think uh, Marlon had a, had a chance, and then Guerrero had a shot. And then Haaland, I think, had another uh, another chance later. And I feel like this is with the substitutions in between is when the when the game started to flip, uh, when Dortmund just found their combinations and got their groove finally. And uh, I feel like at this moment it was already too late for Frankfurt because they already had sort of collectively decided we're just going to write this out. And uh, yeah. To me, it's really nice to see it the other way around for once. And um, also psychologically very interesting that Frankfurt, who have uh, had a lot of nice come-from-behind wins this season, you know, especially that 5-2 against Leverkusen where they were 2-0 down, um, you know, to, to see such a side then not be able to um, conjure up uh, this, this go-getter mentality whatsoever and are just sort of just lying there waiting for it to happen. And uh, it's also nice all the way, <laughs> all the goals that Dortmund did score, to me felt like typical Bayern goals, if, if that makes sense. Because um, think about um, the uh, Hazard goal. You know, it was a, it was just a, a header forward from Hummels of a trap punt. And then uh, you had Hinteregger with a heavy touch. And I think it was Royce Haaland and then... Uh, Hazard in uh, in a very quick transition fashion, you know, just pouncing on that error by Hinteregger. And then uh, the Bellingham goal, to me, also similar. You have a really good attacking moment, but it breaks down at the last second. I think, uh, I don't know who it was. Uh, might have been Hasebe or so, some, someone who, who just poked off the ball from Haaland in, in the box who was just trying to round the last defender and get the shot off. But then the ball lands right at Meunier, you know, as in typical Bayern fashion, I feel like, because Bayern often have these goals where their first attack doesn't work, but then they're so well positioned that they get the second ball. And, uh, you know, you whip in the cross and then uh, Frankfurt can't organize and you have a wide open Bellingham and he actually <laughs> converts, which is really nice. And, uh, you know, then the, the third one, similar, you have another... Uh, cock up by Frankfurt and then Hinteregger I think once again has a heavy touch and it lands for the hood and he just nails it <laughs> so um, the, these are all goals that I absolutely love to see because they are mistake punishing goals and I, I love those goals because it it really uh, hurts the opponent even more so because then they get even more afraid and and uh, you know, it, it messes with their heads just like Frankfurt's first goal messed with Dortmund heads. And uh, for me, those games are extremely fun to watch. And, uh, you know, I, I I appreciate your confidence that you were like, oh, Dortmund are going to win it now. I mean, Bellingham scored it in the 87th minute. So I don't know if this is for granted, but uh, yeah, you could definitely see the confidence. And um, yeah, it's it's nice that Dortmund did pull it out in the end because... You know, all of uh, Bundesliga Twitter was already, you know, on Dortmund's backs about them not being able to capitalize on uh, on Bayern's blunder. 
which at this point I find a little comical. You know, it's a little forced to really make it a title race, um, which to me, it just doesn't feel that way. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, it, it was nice to to pull this one out because, um, you know, now Dortmund have also an eight-point lead on fifth place Leverkusen, you know, just in that sense, since uh, there's Europa League football coming soon. And I feel like Dortmund might drop a couple of points here and there. Um, this is a very healthy cushion to have, and I don't want to really worry about Champions League qualification uh, toward the end of the season. So in that regard, a very important win. Also, you have a 10-point margin now in Frankfurt. Also very important because I feel like they will have a strong season as well. So, um, yeah, very glad uh, with how Dortmund got this win in the end. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, how these goals were all scored and came about? Well, I like your comparison with Bayern because, you know, Bayern, you know, they'll come, they'll go down and then all of a sudden, like they, a switch gets flipped between the uh, the opponent becoming more passive because that does happen far too often against Bayern, as dot one proof, um, and uh, Bayern kind of kicking it up a notch, and it's just the goals and the win seems inevitable at that point, and that's how it just felt for me. Once, once you know, once Dortmund got the the one goal I'm like okay I th I think a two two could work because I remember us talking about it like, ah my gut says two two and then the, the Bellingham's goal and as much as people like to dogpile on Thomas Meunier his crossing is absolutely awesome um he he's his crossing is is very very dangerous so uh, especially all credit if you to don't have there. any pressure on him. Well, yeah. I mean, well, that's with anybody. Uh, but his crosses are just, they are like the right height, the right whip, the right pace and position. It's, they're horrible to defend against uh, for a center back. Um, and then Dahut with a really nice goal, like a, let's call it like a Leon Goretzka type, you know, pick it up, get around a couple of players and then whip it in. And that's really what it was. It was, uh, you could just see the confidence was there. Um, there were a lot of people and I, and I agree with you. I mean, there were a lot of people after 45 minutes giving a 90 minute analysis of the match <laughs> and how horrible don't want are and how much they suck and they don't have the mentality to win games when they have to. Well, obviously, uh, I like what Phil Bonnie said. However, <laughs> you know, wait a minute, because uh, he kind of made fun of himself and, and of others who who kind of jumped uh, the gun a little bit there. And a lot of people said, well, Ma, uh, what do you expect when Dahoud is playing in the eight or in the sixth position? He's not a six. Well, yeah, of course he can be. You know, um, who's your alternative there? Axel Witzel? Um, No, thank you. I think Dahoud uh, did a pretty good job asked to play the position that he did and that had not really any negative ramifications or explanations as to why Frankfurt did what they did so uh it was good to see him score and kind of take that situation and honestly the entire last 30 minutes by the scruff of the neck I mean Dahoud was a key factor in that with Togan Azad I I hope that Azad just maintains more health that he can start more regularly because I truly believe that if he was healthy more often he would play way more often um, because just the difference he brings but then again throwing him in off the bench that's I mean that's another thing that people always talk about with Bayern you know you take off Kingsley Coman you bring on Serge Gnabry you know, I mean, it's that kind of like you're not yeah, really or, knee or something like that. Yeah, you're yeah. not really getting worse. And and that's you you throw on someone like Togan Azad or once he's ready, you throw on a Gio Reyna or Gio Reyna starts and then you throw in somebody else or even Julian Branten on the wing, which I am way more happy with in that situation. Uh, I think that's when Dot won't just become really, really dangerous. And so... It was a great final 30 minutes. It was the exact type of statement that Dortmund needed, that these players needed, also to shut some people up for once. Because, <laughs> um, oh my God. And, uh, and, and the same thing with Erling Haaland. 
you know, him and Hintaega going at it. I loved that. I thought that was perfect. You know, that that's that attitude of getting in the face and not backing down. Because Martin Hintaega <laughs> is a player who loves to wind up others and get in people's face and be physical and be a thorn and the pain in the ass and a shithouser, which... Frankfurt have a history of central defenders who love to be that guy. Yeah, Zambrano um, is probably one of them. Yeah, highlights. Zambrano is like the best one. But Zambrano was a dirtbag. I mean, yeah, there's a difference. There's a complete difference. You know, David Abraham was a dirtbag, whereas Hintag is not a dirtbag. But he does love to get under people's skin. And it was just perfect. And people were criticizing and... Uh, complaining about Holland and, oh, it's too much emotion. He needs to continue. So what is it, okay? Is it Dortmund don't have enough emotion or they have too much? You know, you you can't actually complain about the same thing I, I love, in two different I love fucking how this ways. One journalist literally asked Rose about the, uh, you know, uh, Holland needs to, like, grab his balls there <laughs> to gesture. I mean, honestly, I know. though, I... I mean, it's it's really great to see the shithousery at the end for Dortmund because you just know the, the passion, the fire is back because this would have never happened in the Hertha game. Let's be honest. This team was mentally drained and dead after dropping points in Bochum, then having this weird 3 nothing win against Fürth where everyone's already complaining and then just collapsing like a house of cards against Hertha Berlin. So it was really important, I think, for me personally to see whether this team can, you know, put it all back together and, uh, you know, the the closeout of this game is just beautiful because you don't see it often that Erling Haaland, of all players, who wants to score a million goals every game, is driving the ball to the corner flag. And then after the routine, was it with Bellingham? I don't even know with who, who it was, but after he received the ball, might have been Hazard, you know, just just smashes the ball against a Frankfurt player to get another corner and celebrates. To yeah, me, that was That was epic. awesome. It's awesome. It's, it's That's fun awesome. to watch as a, as a awesome. fan. Yeah, you want this. Yes, we just beat you at the yes. final session. You are down and now we don't give you even a chance to come back because we bury the ball on the corner flag. And if you do not stand exactly behind this little marker, we're not going to take the corner and it's just going to be a whole minute to run off and we're just going to gesture to the referee that... And Dico or whoever it was is not uh, not not in, on the right position, and it's just gonna take forever until we take the corner and we're right, and then we take the corner and then we take another corner, and then the game's over. And yeah, I love it. That to me is is uh, is so clutch. And damn, I mean, it's great that the who is of all players who's you know not always on mark scores as early for us to even bring Dortmund there. So um yeah. Just, just an awesome game in the end, and and a great comeback. And uh, obviously, you know, Dortmund players, I think, uh, talk a lot about how great it would have been uh, to have this sort of comeback with fans in the stands. And I agree, but I feel like uh, with had the stadium been full, then uh, Dortmund might have not pulled this off the same way. <laughs> this might have one little caveat, but nevertheless, I really enjoyed this. And uh, you know, if if you look at the Bundesliga results. Um, I, it, it just does a world of good. I mean, yes, Bayern lost, but also at the same time, Freiburg uh, drew against Bielefeld. You had uh, uh, Leverkusen draw against Union Berlin. So that's uh, also very important in, in the context. And it's nice to see that Cologne did win away to Hertha Berlin and that Bochum uh, got a, a nice win against Wolfsburg, who I think now have lost eight in a row. Unfortunately, uh, Leipzig won 4 1 against Mainz and. Uh, yeah, Hoffenheim now in third place after that win in Augsburg, or no, at home against Augsburg. Um, so, yeah, uh, I feel like the Bundesliga midfield overall is nice and tight. There's a gap between Bayern and the rest of the league, and then uh, a gap between Dortmund and the rest of the league, literally, since it's six points up and six points down. So, um, yeah, let's let's see where we have to look going forward, whether we have to look more... Uh, to the positions uh, beneath Dortmund or to the uh, place up, if there is one. I don't know where it goes out from here, if, if Bayern struggle or not, and if Dortmund can capitalize or not. But at least, uh, yeah, Bayern did struggle against Gladbach as so often. So kudos to Gladbach, I guess. Um, so, yeah. But uh, now, obviously, the next game is already on Friday. 
And it's against Freiburg, who are playing a terrific season. And Freiburg obviously did win the reverse fixture. Um, Freiburg now have uh, 30 points, are in fourth place. And, uh, you know, almost a miracle season. But then if you look where, you know, other opponents are, say like Leverkusen or Leipzig or Wolfsburg or so, then you kind of understand that uh, things are possible this season. So, Matthias, uh, I've read today the Ruhr Nachrichten that Dortmund uh, Wednesday's practice session uh, puts a, a heavy focus on set pieces. Now, I don't know, I don't know why they would do that, considering that Freiburg have only scored 18 set pieces uh, this season from their 30 or, or 16 or something like that, and uh, Dortmund have I think conceded 10 out of their 28 goals. No idea why why they w would do that. Um, unfortunately, Rafael Guerrero. Uh, has missed this training session. I'm not in entirely sure what that means for his game on Friday, but uh, it does not bode well. And uh, if he's indeed out, that would be, in my book, another really terrible thing. Uh, Zagadou and Akanji are back on the training pitch, but at least according to Ruhr Nachrichten, there should not be options yet uh, to play against Freiburg. And uh, I don't know what the Marius Wolf situation is at this point, I'm afraid. But uh, I I hope he is back in action as well. And other, other than that, I don't think I have too many personal updates, which is a positive because usually uh, they are torrid. And uh, after talking about the Frankfurt game or in the, in the preview about the uh, Girona return, I think this time we can actually uh, have one, which is also nice because I already talked about Dortmund making... Uh, you know, or about late subs making a positive impact uh, in with G Arena having the context there, but it was Torgen Hazard in the end. But either way, uh, the more, the better. So, absolutely difficult game. Uh, what are you expecting from Dortmund against Freiburg and what do Dortmund have to do to beat this Freiburg team? Well, um, I mean, it's a different situation than when these teams first met this season. Um, I mean, one, not concede a set-piece goal <laughs> uh, would be nice. Uh, obviously, <laughs> if memory serves me, Vincenzo Grifo had an absolute worldy uh, free-kick goal, if I remember correctly. Um, but you can't really defend that. That's just... That was just a sublime so shot. So once again, not giving away fouls. So, Check. <laughs> not, gi not giving away fouls in bad situations. Uh, uh, and, and maybe the set beast training was more in a reaction to conceding from Frankfurt um, <laughs> than necessarily conceding from Freiburg. But it's an area that you want to clamp down on because I think that's an area that Freiburg may try to play for. Um, there will be, I think, what, 750 fans in the Westfalen Stadion, yeah. uh, if I read unfortunately, correctly. Unfortunately, um, uh, it's, it's uh, only enough to fit all of Dortmund's injured players. Yes, it's, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but uh, you know, Frankfurt, uh, sorry, Frankfurt, Freiburg, whatever, it's close enough. <laughs> they both have a uh, bird Freib on the crest. <laughs> correct, correct, correct. It was not a good day for Eagles. Uh, this weekend, so that made me very happy. Anyway, um, <laughs> Freiburg, they will, uh, you know, obviously, they will press. They will not be passive. I think they'll probably press a little bit deeper against uh, Dortmund, so sit a little bit deeper, but then press in that kind of mid midfield more than a super high press necessarily, uh, because they also don't want the season to now completely fall apart on them. Uh, given how how well they've been doing, how tight things are. I mean, between eighth place and third place, it's four points. So it's it's very, very tight in there. Uh, and resurgence you know, sees of, of teams like Leipzig. You know, you can't uh, discount that. So to beat Freiburg, don't do stupid things like stupid fouls. Or stupid central midfield giveaways, Julian Brandt. Um, I think if you can limit that and do similar things like you did against Frankfurt near the end, where Dortmund did a really good job in stretching Frankfurt uh, versus just trying to shove it down their throat centrally, um, I think that that will really help. Not having Guerrero... Um, 
hurts from a playmaking aspect, but of course his natural inclination is to come inside and play centrally, which I don't think is really going to help you much against Freiburg. The problem is Nico Schulz doesn't help you much against Freiburg in general. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, well, that's I mean, a, it's, a it's just bit in, of a concern. In terms of you know, build-up and avoiding mistakes, it's actually crucial to have Guerrero in there over Schultz because he has so many more solutions if he gets isolated to to pass the ball not to an opponent. I mean, we have seen it from Guerrero. Yeah, his pass way, completion is but if you, really high. It's like ninety four percent or something. Yeah, but it's crazy high. But but if if you you know if you just play the odds and the, the numbers really it's you, you just want him there just for uh the sake of, of keeping the ball in, in better places. And uh I 100% agree with you if you avoid stupid fouls and don't give away the ball in in difficult situations, let's say. Um, I feel like you have already halfway beaten this Freiburg team. G- gra- granted that Freiburg have some really good combination play as well and uh, they can create without you making mistakes. That also does happen. But, uh, I, you know, I feel like there was a a shift in Christian Streich's approach to, you know, play against Dortmund because for the longest time, I've not looked it up, but Dortmund had this really long streak against against Freiburg and basically Freiburg came to Dortmund or the other way around and Dortmund just always trashed them and it was the easiest game of of the year almost and it was always like 4-1, 5-1, 4-0 and stuff like that. Um, Because Freiburg wanted to play against Dortmund the way they want to play against most of the teams. You know, it was a very idealistic approach by by Streich where they wanted to play football and, and you know, try to have possession football and play it out of the back. And uh, this always failed horribly because Dortmund are a better team. And if you try to play football against them and you mis- make mistakes, Dortmund usually punish you. And at some point, Christian Streich has learned and he has said, okay, let's not do that. Let's defend a little bit more and play more in the counterattack. And voila, <laughs> it was not that difficult, but uh, it, it really had uh, Freiburg to, to win a lot of or draw a lot of games against Dortmund in, uh, in recent history. Um, I feel like uh, really insane finishing also helped Freiburg quite a deal where they uh, were really lucky that Dortmund didn't convert a lot of chances while they scored a million worldies. I don't know. I'm just saying this from the top of my head, but that's just how it feels like. Um, so my hope for this game is also that this luck and variance, let's call it, uh, changes a little bit and Freiburg do not score with almost every shot and uh, F- Dortmund, on the on the other hand, have a couple of better finishing moments and touches, say Haaland or uh, Bellingham, I think, who in the, in the first leg uh, or first in the reverse fixture along with Marlin, uh, you know, could have done a little bit better and maybe this time around they do. Uh, it's always hard to to script a game in, in your head, but uh, I feel like Dortmund taking on Freiburg should be a, a relatively even game, but in the, in the details, Dortmund should still come out of on top. Now, Matthias, one major factor that we've just benefited from against Frankfurt is now... You know, since it's a home game, uh, the reverse, because not having a full Westfalen stadion obviously hurts Dortmund. I think there's there are no ways about it. I don't know what an impact 750 people will have, but uh, to me it's a bit annoying. I feel like you can, you know, allocate 10% and still relatively easy, uh, easily distribute fans in a way that they're distanced. You know, it's outside anyway. And if everyone is wearing a mask, I don't think there's much of a COVID transmission, if I'm perfectly honest. So I feel like 750 people, uh, I don't know. I don't agree with that sort of politics. I feel like uh, there can be a significantly higher amount in the Westfalen Stadion, to be honest. So um, this is obviously something that has hurt Dortmund in the past during the... uh, you know, bigger stretch of, of Geisterspiele. Um, it, it was not pleasant. Overall, it is not pleasant. I feel like I have a hard time wanting to watch football even when there are no, no fans in the stands, especially when it's not Dortmund. Um, it's tedious to me. Um, 
what what do you make out of uh the absence of fans and uh, what do you think you know the the net impact it will have on on Dortmund's points tally in in for their home games Well, I mean, I agree with you in terms of the politics. Uh, I feel like that's kind of an arbitrary number. Uh, I think a percentage based on capacity, especially for outdoor venues uh, that are as, I mean, this isn't like it's a concert where it's, you can't really contain people. I mean, it's a stadium with assigned seats. It's, uh, I, I think, um, I think it is absolutely possible for, the Westfalen Stadion to host five to 10,000 people and ensure, especially with the whole 2G plus regulations that, that Germany has right now. I, th I think it, it, it yeah, it, it's a little bit annoying as far as the impact of fans. Well, I, I noticed it. I mean, I watch whether it's a uh, Serie A or a uh, Premier League or I watch plenty of rugby uh, from Ireland and stadiums are full and it has a huge impact on the teams, on your experience as a fan watching. It just feels more alive than these empty Bundesliga stadiums where it it's hard to shake the feeling of a training game. Really, like this is just practice. Obviously, it's not. We've gotten a little bit used to it. But since we did have fans in stadiums for a stretch and other leagues do, it's just uh, it's in, in, you know, watching the NFL and there, there are people in the stadiums. It just it just doesn't mm, there's there's a huge chunk missing. That's when you notice, especially for teams like Frankfurt or Dortmund, less so Bayern or Hoffenheim or Leipzig. But uh, for for teams like Dortmund or Frankfurt, Freiburg, so on, it makes a big difference to have that vocal support in the stadium to push on your players and to intimidate the opponent. And that is a clear, there is an intimidation factor there. It's been psychologically proven. So this uh, definitely, just like it played into Dortmund's hands with Frankfurt not having fans there, I think it plays into Freiburg's hands for not having 750 fans there. Uh, especially if one of them is an annoying person who just whistles really loud the whole time. Because, uh, God, that's annoying. Um, but that it's it's frustrating, but it just is what it is right now. Uh, and Dortmund, uh, you know, in the tail end of last season, got their great groove going on and there were no fans in the stadium. So I, I feel like they'll just have to buckle down and get it done. Yeah, I mean... You can obviously win games without fans in a sense. <laughs> it's it's not like, um, you know, it's impossible also for Dortmund. Um, but uh, yeah, still, I feel like uh, a lot is being taken away from it. But uh, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting one to me because it's it's going to be one of the very few times this season, it feels to me, where Dortmund actually get to open the match day because considering they will have a Europa League run, most of the con you know following games will be on Sundays. And um, to me, a win on a Friday night is one of the best things that can happen to a Bundesliga fan because then you can just kick back and relax and, and watch all the other teams take points off each other. Uh, ideally, when you're in Germany, you can watch some Saturday afternoon conference and then uh, in, in you know this weekend's case, you can then watch the top spiel between Gladbach and Leverkusen, which is always a good game. And uh, yeah, th there you go. You know, maybe you won even... If, if you feel so inclined, watch Cologne against Bayern in a single option because traditionally Bayern also struggle against Cologne and not maybe so much in recent years, but, um, you know, <laughs> in the Lukas Podolski days, uh, there were there were certainly times where Cologne got uh, good results against Bayern and, you know, with uh, uh, Who's their coach now? I feel like they can rekindle this a little bit. I mean, they came very close to to getting points off Bayern in the uh, first game this uh, season. So who knows? That's all I'm saying. But uh, the condition for me to enjoy any rest of the Bundesliga is obviously F uh, Freiburg losing in Dortmund. So, um, you know, if Dortmund can take care of that, um, why not? And Matthias, you, 
you know we're doing this for many many years now i think this is our what 10th season now but i feel that like is correct i do not learn i'm right now somehow still optimistic about this game even though i know there will be the same mistakes as we've seen in all the previous 5 to 10 games but somehow i feel like this frankfurt game will help dortmund to uh play a better match against freiburg and I don't know about you, but I feel like they might just take the lead and uh, manage to uh, not lose it uh, like Frankfurt did, but uh, deal with it in a more professional way. I feel like Dortmund will win this 2 nothing or so, um, and it will feel a bit like a Champions League game where Dortmund are just a tad more mature team and uh, punish Freiburg for a couple mistakes while... Dortmund, on the other hand, just uh, clamped down. I don't know why. I just feel like it's going to be a game where Dortmund play not with the most risk and uh, do not allow many mistakes. And hence Freiburg, I don't know, do not find their groove. And it's going to be a low chance game with, uh, you know, Dortmund coming out on top. I don't know why I think this is going to happen because... If I look at uh, the vast catalog of how Dortmund played in in, uh, in recent games and the sort of mistakes they continuously commit, there's not much evidence for my thesis there. But nevertheless, that is my gut feeling. So I don't know why I cannot learn, why I'm very optimistic about this game against Freiburg, but I just am. You know, maybe a more realistic scoreline is a 3-1 to one win or so, but... I don't know. Something just tells me it's especially because it's it's a flat like game again. Um, that and, and Dortmund will certainly not underestimate Freiburg now since they have played this sort of season and are in fourth place and so uh, already beat Dortmund. I don't know. I just feel like that the approach of uh, this Dortmund team is going to be way better than uh, than previously against against Freiburg and uh, I think that the game plan will work out a little better this time. The only caveat I really have is that Akanji still isn't back. And uh, whether you play Jan in centre-back or Pongratic or whoever, uh, it's it's going to be a bit of a struggle. I'll be honest. Yeah, you know, I agree. Um, you know, I'm the eternal optimist. That's just, that's just the thing. I think uh, Dortmund are going to win the treble every year and the Cowboys will always win the Super Bowl. Um, and the Red Sox always win the World Series. Needless to say, that doesn't happen. Um, that being said, the one the one piece of advice I want to give Borussia Dortmund is don't be like Borussia Mönchengladbach when you play against Freiburg because that was bad. <laughs> that was that was really bad. And in case you missed it, Freiburg destroyed Gladbach six 0 Um. No, I, I think uh, it, perfect timing to face Freiburg would have been in November when Freiburg lost all their Bundesliga matches that month. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Of course, Freiburg coming off of a disappointing draw against Arminia Bielefeld, Dortmund coming off of a high. Um, and so I share your optimism. I think Dortmund are going to run rampant and destroy and take Freiburg apart in a very close, frustrating 2-1 victory. <laughs> um, I... I, I just see uh, Freiburg scoring. Um, I don't see any way around it. If you've got Nico Schulz and someone other than Akanji next to Hummels, I just, it, it's just tough because if Nico Schulz is playing, then Hummels is going to feel like he has to do more. And when Hummels feels like he has to do more, well, it's not just Hummels. When any defender feels like they have to do more, yeah. compensate the weaknesses of a fellow defender, they will naturally overstep, be out of position, and then you have problems. Um, yeah, or it can happen to the goalkeepers. Correct. We've seen with Kuhl yeah. against Bielefeld. Well, exactly. Uh, and, or Bochum, yeah, sorry. I, and, uh, and, and Hertha. Um, oh, no, that was Marvin Hitz. Sorry. Yeah. Different point, Swiss though. guy. Ach, just Swiss keepers, okay? <laughs> just pick a Swiss keeper, Dortmund has them. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the well, except for Borussia him, has them. <laughs> Bo uh, Borussia has all the Swiss keepers. No, uh, if Dortmund, Dortmund will make mistakes because you don't have Akanji, who I think is one of the best central defenders in the Bundesliga. 
Uh, and that naturally leads to Holmes wanting to do more because he probably will have to. And that just leads to gaps. That's just the way it works. Um, ahead of them, though, is the big issue. And this is going back to a topic, of course, that Marco Rosa addressed pre-Frankfurt was, you know, the, the back line always looks bad in those situations, but the situations occur further up the pitch. The unnecessary losses of possession in the middle of the midfield third, those are the ones you can't have. If you eliminate that, Julian Brandt, then things will be a lot better because that's the moment where Freiburg will press because they know that's where Dortmund are vulnerable in, in turning over possession. They will press there and then the transitions happen. If you can eliminate that and have a more mm, controlled buildup in that area and more it's just better possession, not lose the ball, I think then Dortmund win this game. Um so, yeah, I, I'm going to stick to a 2-1, but it's not going to be comfortable and it's not going to be pretty. And probably for my own sanity, I'm not going to look at Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it's it's probably for the best. Now, I mean, obviously what needs to be mentioned about Freiburg, which we haven't done this far, is for everyone who does not know, they have tied with Bayern the best defense in the Bundesliga. They have only conceded 18 goals so far. Um, you know, Dortmund in the same time frame have conceded 10 more goals. And uh, this, to me, is something that Freiburg do really well this season because uh, it gives them the chance to compete in almost every game. You know, I do not remember them ever being really blown out. I mean, their their highest loss this season in the Bundesliga was literally 2-0 <laughs> against Frankfurt. That's their highest loss. Otherwise, they have lost 2-1 against Hoffenheim, they have lost 2-1 against Bochum, and 2-1 against Frankfurt, 2-1 uh, uh, against Bayern, and um, I feel like that was because up until that point, they were unbeaten, right? Until, met yeah, the, the first 10 matches, they said, don't, did not lose a game. Um, maybe that was sort of a psychology, you know, a li little blow to, to Freiburg to, to lose against Bayern the way they did. I don't know, it happens often that uh, once teams face Bayern that uh, then fall apart. You've seen Dortmund do it. You've seen Leverkusen do it very prominently last season. So who knows? But um, yeah, I feel like the um, the game, the draw against Bielefeld was also a bit unlucky. And uh, one thing we should mention there is that uh, their uh, backup goalkeeper, whose name just evades me, um, who's in for Mark Flecken because Flecken, I think, is, uh, you know, out with COVID. Uh, yeah, it's Benjamin Uphoff is his name. He uh, did not have his best game. And obviously, I talk a lot about how a good goalkeeper is obviously the backbone of your defense and makes a lot of difference. And um, yeah, he didn't look all too great against Bielefeld. And uh, I feel like this, for example, can also make the difference because Mark Flecken, for example, uh, had a really good performance in the other game against Dortmund. So I really hope that uh, Upofons again is uh, on a similar standard as he was against Bielefeld. Now he has maybe a little chip on his shoulder too. I don't know if that helps him or hurts him, but uh, you know these are things I should state. And uh, another thing that's really interesting about Freiburg is that they do not have this um, number one striker, let's say, because the best goal scorer of them are actually four. They have Philipp Lienhardt, who's a defender with four goals, uh, you know, because of their set-piece threat. Then you have Lukas Höhler, Vincenzo Grifo, and uh, Jong Wu Jong, uh, who all have scored four goals. And then the next uh, players, you have Nikolas Höfler with two goals, and you have Nico Schlotterbeck with two goals, who, again, is a defender. And um, to me, it really uh, says that this is a team that pounces ruthlessly on errors of, of opponents and score a lot of goals with set pieces. I mean, I said it before, uh, over 50% of their goals are scored from dead ball situations. And um, yeah, so you need to contain that as much as possible. Um, and I don't, I don't think defending against Freiburg per se isn't all too hard. It's just that um, they make a lot out of very little. So 
that's a problem that Dortmund have where they defend really well for a long time but then have the weirdest, most comical error and uh, then are behind or whatever. So this is just for once I want Dortmund to clamp down on and uh, try to avoid and maybe they can. I don't know. I, I just feel like some some momentum is coming from Dortmund. I don't know why. So um yeah, but it's it's a really interesting Freiburg team because obviously they don't have a squad that uh, is supposedly playing for champ gunning for the champ Champions League. There are so much better teams on paper than Freiburg, but uh, you know, kudos to them because they are showing consistency. And uh, I think Christian Streich now is the longest serving coach uh, for for one team in the Bundesliga and uh, yeah this success is really paying off for them and when other teams struggle Freiburg are there and they're playing way above their potential now obviously they might still fall down drop down have a couple of bad games have such a stint as you said in November but uh, for now they are an opponent that you must not underestimate and um, feel like they come to Dortmund and uh, have a really good chance of taking points home so um yeah, I'm personally looking forward to this game because I just feel like it's going to be a good football game against a very formidable opposition, just as it was against Freiburg, uh, Frankfurt. Jesus. <laughs> See, told you, it's not that easy. Yeah, no, um, I, I make this mistake <laughs> way too often too. No, I agree with you. It's going to be an interesting Bundesliga match, that's for sure. Yeah, so how how do you like the idea of Nico Schlotterbeck uh, actually joining Dortmund at the end of the season? I like that idea a lot. Um, I think he would be an excellent addition to Borussia Dortmund's backline, and I really hope it happens. Yeah, it's a it's it's a really good player, and I don't think there's too much of demand. I mean, can change from from other big clubs around Dortmund. I feel like uh, it would be the the perfect uh, switch. Also, Dortmund desperately need uh, better center backs. And I mean, he is left footed. So also a really good replacement for Mats Hummels, who, you know, is getting a little older. And uh, yeah, I'm, I I think um, he is uh, he is a player to, to keep an eye on, uh, especially also in this game. I feel like he could be very frustrating. And the good news is he's playing already relatively well, but he's also... You know, he's 22 years old. Uh, so it's a player that Dortmund, if they sign him, will also still have to develop because being a centre-back for Dortmund is entirely different than being a centre-back for Freiburg. And I really hope that uh, now we're all saying this is a sensible transfer, but I really hope they, whatever they do in their scouting, make sure that uh, his transition to Dortmund also makes sense and is a fit. Because... Um, before Nico Schulz joined Dortmund for 25 million, you could make the argument that he's a decent left back in the Bundesliga. But playing under Nagelsmann for Hoffenheim, where A, mistakes are not really that. Uh, I don't know. They, they, they just don't come up that often because it's Hoffenheim, and who cares if, if they make mistakes and lose? And, and B, Hoffenheim had a system under Nagelsmann that really suited uh, Nico Schulz's strengths and uh, really covered his weaknesses and Dortmund do not play that way. Um, I just hope that, that a similar mistake is not being committed again because I think when Dortmund, or if Dortmund sign Schlotterbeck, it's going to be a decent amount of money and uh, money is tight right now, obviously, when uh, <laughs> you don't have full stadiums. You know, the amount of money loses per match day is insane. I think it's like three or four million which is just crazy in itself. So, um, yeah, someone I'm, for now, I'm excited about and feel like this is one of those positive transfers that could actually happen. And uh, he could be someone that Dortmund actually have for a long term as a really good number one starting center back, especially when he succeeds Hummels. Um, to me, for now, this is a good transfer, but, uh, you know, it, it's it's always hard to gauge how it really works out in the end. Um, but for, for now, I'm uh, I'm positive about it. You know, um, some fans I've I've seen had their eyes on Marvin Friedrich, who's now, uh, I think, probably going to replace uh, Matthias Ginter in Gladbach. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. But it's certainly a position that Dortmund have to address. 
And uh, yeah, just wanted to put ev everyone's focus on this player um, again, since, uh, you know, he is playing really well. And uh, also beware, he has a brother. His name is Kevin Schlotterbeck. So uh, make sure you don't mix those two up. Yeah, because that's never happened to me. Um, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, Dortmund, if, if something like this would happen, um, you know, I mean, two players that Dortmund in the past have gotten from Freiburg that really came to embody Borussia Dortmund, of course, Jörg Heinrich and Sebastian Kehl. Um, it's funny that you mentioned Matthias Ginter because he too came from Freiburg and that didn't quite work out as planned. Exactly. I still have um, my ESPN column where I was so, like, yeah, Ginter is going to be the next Hummels. And that blew up in my face quite well. That was one of my yeah, first hot takes yeah. that <laughs> they were quite wrong. So hopefully more Heinrich and Kehl and a little bit less Ginter. If it happens. If it happens, of course. Yeah, or Birki. Okay. <laughs> who also came Birki from Freiburg? Is, who came from Freiburg and had good seasons at Dortmund. Yeah. Not gonna not gonna hear anything else. <laughs> All right, Matthias. Uh you already gave your scoreline prediction, right? It was a dominant two one, two -one win. Yeah, Re okay. Resounding two one victory, yes. <laughs> I mean it's, it's in, in this season I really don't care how the results come about. Don't want to have lucked their way to a couple of wins here and there. You know, it's it's always easy to point at the you know, losses of points against Bochum and Hertha, but at the same time I think Dortmund snuck away a result, for example, against Cologne. And, uh, you know, against Union Berlin, I think they were also a bit lucky um, that they uh, managed to, to pull it out in the end. Uh, I think it was a 4-2 win. And uh, the 4-3 win in, in Leverkusen also, uh, yeah, <laughs> a bit lucky. And I think that 3-2 against Hoffenheim, um, I think that was deserved, but uh, also could have turned uh, quite easily. So, yeah, there were a couple of games here and there where I actually would say that, um, you know, Dortmund uh, were a bit lucky to to get points out of these games. So, um, yeah. I'm I'm just hoping that the streak in, in, in terms of getting more good results and bad results in, in games that are, you know, can really go either way continues. And in, in that regard, Matthias, I think it's time to end this show. Um, I think we'll be back either Sunday or Monday or something like that we, because we have to preview the Sao Paulo game, uh, the cup game. I'll try to find a guest for that one. Um, but in the meantime, please tell our listeners where to follow you on the Twitter webs. Uh, you can unfortunately find me on Twitter at Matthias Suk. <laughs> you can find me at Stefan Butzko and you can follow all of us at Yellow Wall Pod on Twitter and Facebook. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, Go to theyellowwall.net and you will find uh, all the information there, also our Patreon and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, that's all for, from us for this week. And uh, all I can say is, as always, thank you for listening and goodbye.